to Experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 174 of Category 5 Technology TV. It's Tuesday, January the 18th, 2011. Wow. How are you? I am doing well. Yeah, good. I was good. feeling a little sniffly last week, but I'm great this week. Feeling good? And I'm looking forward and to I was a smart. fun episode 174. I brought my runner. All right. There she is. Nice. So uh, when I'm out of water, I'm good to go. How I was you like hoping that? you'd have something else here for me. But no, no, just the water. Just Nothing the water. Like Sorry about that, dude. It's G. <laughs> hey everybody, nice to have you here on Category5.tv. Please join us in the chat room and you'll find that online, www.category5.tv during the live show and all through the week. And certainly you can also join us by uh, just visiting irc.freenode.net. You can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey Hillary, how are you? Hey everyone, I am fabulous. Just reporting to you live from school land again. Sorry, I'm not live in the studio because that is the most fun. But don't you worry because I've got lots to tell you about what's coming up in the newsroom. Sony is suing hackers who broke the PlayStation 3 copyright protection code. Um, butterflies are soon going to make counterfeiting virtually impossible. Steve Jobs is taking a medical leave of absence from Apple. 98 pound meaning dollars in um, Britain, computers will help users in the UK get online. A new gaming platform promises to bring thousands of games to Linux. And lastly, a group of international scientists believe they're about six years away from being able to resurrect the mammoth. So stick around for the latest news from the Category5.tv newsroom. Uh, good old UK currency, eh, Hill? Wow. Oh, I'm so to, confused. It's a 98 pound computer. <laughs> 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 That's a big old computer, isn't it? Thanks for thanks for clarifying that, and we're looking forward to what's coming up. Also coming up on tonight's episode of Category 5 TV, we are giving away two pogo plugs this week. Two. And you got to stick around, because at the end of the show, we're going to tell you how you can get that. And also, uh, if you've been following our website, Category5.tv, you know that tonight we are going to be looking at Synergy. And I'm not just talking about that vibe that you get between yeah. Eric and I and Hillary over in Skype. Skype world, <laughs> but uh, also Synergy, the uh, software platform, which allows you to share your mouse and keyboard with multiple computers, be it Linux, Windows, Mac, doesn't matter. It's going to be fantastic, so stick around for that. All right. Cool. So what do you got going on? Well, we have some questions. We do, in fact, have a question that I didn't get to last week. Should we do that right off the bat? Mm, that'd be fantastic. Because this poor fella here, Dennis Finnegan. Hey, Dennis. Seems to be having trouble logging into the chat room. Oh dear. So we should fix that for him. He keeps giving me a message that I have to log in with my username and password in auth mode. However, sign in slash out shows me as logged in. Help, I miss not being able to interact. This started two months ago. Hmm, okay. So what we're talking about on our website when you click on to chat, which is interact, chat room, that launches the chat room. And, and what happens is, is by default, it's going to fill in your logged in user information, okay? And what's happening to you there, Dennis, is that it, it sounds like you, either you or somebody else has registered your nickname with the Freenode servers. So when you enter your nickname there, so in my case, it's, it's automatically defaulting to Robbie Ferguson. So the warning that you're getting is that somebody else has already registered that nickname. So if it's you, you need to check off that auth to services and enter your username and password because you've got a registered username for the Freenode chat server. Okay. In order to get around that, if you're not sure what it was, maybe you've lost it, now there are ways to get around that. You can find out by uh, joining the chat room uh, number Freenode because that's your support channel for uh, the Freenode chat services. But in the meantime, you can get around that real quick just to be able to join us in the chat room tonight just by simply adding, you know, for me, I could put Robbie Ferguson 5 or you know underscore 10 or something like that. So or 11 that's all or that's 12 yeah, you know, 73 or change your name. But if it <laughs> if if you're using a unique username, it's possible that perhaps you registered it, in which case uh, you'll want to message Nick serve and they'll be able to 
uh, send you your password and even reset it if you've lost it. So, because they can send that to your uh, your email address that's associated with the account. Well, there you cool. go. Uh, to to get information from NixServe, get into the chat, okay, and then all you have to do. It's really quite straightforward, actually. Once you're connected to the chat, so you can be any user, go slash msg for private message, nick serve help. And you're going to see that you get a new little window here from nick serve, and it's got all the little bits of help and how you can use nick serve to get your, uh, to get help with your nick, which is your alias ah. on irc.freenode.net. So if you're still stuck, let us know. Pop us an email. Uh, but that should at least l let you uh, connect, get you into the chat room so you can join us during a live show. That would right. be great. Hey, Corey. Mm. John, nice to see you. Agamotto joining us in the chat room. Gadwill, of course. GWG. The Guru. <laughs> nice to see us. You should tell the good folks who you are. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's down there sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Boom. There you go. There you go. Mm. Robbie first. I'm Eric Kidd. Somewhere back there, we've got Johnny hiding behind the camera. Hey, John. Yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have another Dennis asking a question. All right. But this isn't Dennis Finnegan. This is Dennis Kelly. <laughs> and um, he's operating Ubuntu 10.04. And the question about running WinXP in VirtualBox. Do I have to run a virus program in XP in a VirtualBox session? Ah. In interesting question, isn't it? Yeah. Because people think, you think possibly about a virtual machine being virtualized, fake hardware, fake operating system running, do you really need to protect yourself? Fact is, as far as the operating system is concerned, it doesn't know any better. It thinks that you're running real hardware, basically, because you install Windows XP into a virtual computer, and it's just as much Windows XP as would be a native install of Windows XP. So. Incidentally, if you have three virtual machines and they're all Windows, they are each going to require antivirus protection. They're each going to require some form of protection if you're going to be running those on a regular basis. Now, there is a workaround, and that's the fact that you can use snapshots. So once you get your machine perfectly set up, right? once you've got that machine, everything installed, everything working for you, then all you have to do is set up a snapshot, have it so that uh, it reverts to the snapshot every time you reboot. You'll lose any settings, but because of that, you don't need an antivirus in that scenario. Because if you get a virus during that session, you reboot, it reverts to the snapshot, and then you're back to all up and up and running. So, so, so there. But yeah, essentially, if you're running a virtual machine, it's just like a, ver a real piece of hardware. So, cool. Cable 101 oh. says, "Hey." Glad you're liking your pogo plug. Yeah, I, I sent out a tweet today this saying I tweeted. have a brand new pogo plug and it is way cool. Yeah. How yeah. You, how now you've had it for a week. Well, yeah. How have but, you used it so far? I, actually, I was helping a friend out with some stuff and I yeah. had some uh, software, um, okay. and I used my pogo plug. It was at home. I was yeah. over at her place and. I was able so to it gave you access it, to your yeah exactly. I, I I haven't actually played with it as much as I'd like to. Uh, yeah, but uh, you use yeah. a BlackBerry, is that right? Yes. So it'll be interesting to see how the BlackBerry app compares to uh, the iPhone app, for example, or how that okay. compares to uh, well, I'll different platforms back on that we've that. tested on. Yeah, I'll I'd love to hear. Back on that, but yeah, no, it's, it's sure. way cool. Awesome. Um, and it works with you know an external drive or just a little uh, USB yep. drive or whatever you want to or both plug it up to. Yes. What is it? Uh, there's several there's USB ports. Three or four, three or four? Uh, ports. I think three four, on the front, on one the on the back. Or vice versa. Yeah. You're just trying to phase me. One on the front, three on the back. Okay. What he said. <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay. Oh, did I mention we're giving away pogo plugs tonight? Oh yes. I you did, did in sure. fact mention that. Hey, maybe I can win one. I could have two. I have four ports. Okay. Plug it. Okay. Uh, I gotta say, I gotta it. say, with the pogo plug, you know, I I hesitated setting it up, you know, because yeah. I didn't I didn't have much time, and it really, boy, it didn't take much time. It's, no. You plug it in and you you go to uh, the website to activate, and 
it says, hey, we found a Pogo plugin. Viewers are going to have to bear with this. Because yeah, every sorry. time I, I'm, I'm telling you, it was. I know we've gone through this, be, but because I was this is like how, my <laughs> excitement over the Pogo plug all over again. I was amazed you just at got how yours. easy. You know, yeah. I was expecting. Oh, this is going to be a challenge. Grueling, yeah. For it the was amount not, of features, it was not sure. a challenge. Cool. It was not. That's great. Yeah. So what do you got coming up? Another question. Hey, not we to, have not to. We have another question, and yeah, we, we've right. got. We've okay. got probably a dozen questions we should try to get through here. Uh, That's the so, thing, eh? so, we'll, so we'll just keep plowing right through. And if you've got a question for us, it's live at Category5.tv or again, join us in the chat room, Category5.tv. <laughs> uh oh, Gadwell tells me anything I win goes directly to him. I'm excluded from winning. Okay. All right, gotcha. It's a little harsh. Um, okay, this is a question from Jemmy Siegel. And Jemmy, Jemmy is. Um, running Win7 and Ubuntu 10.10. .10. Robbie, great job on the new site. I am located in New Jersey, or is that New Jersey? And <laughs> looking to build an Ubuntu 10.10 .10 system for certification exam studies. Do you have any motherboard recommendations? I will be running VirtualBox running Server 2008 VMS, Windows 7 VMS. VMs, virtual machines. VMs, sorry, did I say that? I did say that. Yeah, okay. Um, Website recommendations are welcome also. Keep up the good work. Gotcha. And hey, New Jersey. Is it just me? Like, are we picking up some kind of weird interference there? Did anyone in the, in the chat room, did you catch that? I didn't catch that. How strange. Or was that you, Hillary? <laughs> She's in the chat room going, I think that was me. She's watching YouTube videos and stuff, not realizing that her microphone is on. Fantastic. Hillary, Fantastic. it is always fun to have you here. You're blushing. <laughs> Stop. Turn it off. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So to touch that question for, for Jemmy, um, appreciate your comments about the site. If you could just leave that up, actually, I'll, I'll kind of glance over here just to, to make sure I cover everything. So you've got, you, you are looking for advice on the, uh, on the motherboard purchase. It's really kind of hard to, to make one particular suggestion because it depends on what you want to do and what chipset you want to go with. Uh, personally, I'm an Intel guy versus AMD, but AMD has made a lot of progress as far as I'm concerned over the years, and compatibility with 64-bit uh, Linux is, is there, and that's good. Um, but I still use Intel systems across the board. So um, ASUS, A-S-U-S, is a company that I really I like their motherboards. They make a good product, and uh, basically what you want to look out for is just if it's going to be... And you did pronounce that correctly. I did. I'd said Asus for a hundred years until I called them one day and they answered the phone just That's the way exactly you said it. That's exactly how it just happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly how it happened to me. Um, so with a motherboard, I look for solid state capacitors. Those are, now you could do like a search, uh, Google Images will just do a, a search for solid state capacitor versus capacitor and you'll see the difference. A uh, solid state capacitor is basically going to, um, it's not going to burst as easily, it's not going to have the. It's not prone to failing like a like a standard uh, kind of cheap capacitor would be. So, um, so that's one of the things I always look for. Uh, I'll open up. I'll let the chat room kind of give their feedback about what uh, what brands they prefer or what uh, particular motherboard. But because your you know your your needs are basic, you need uh, you need to be able to virtualize. So you need to be using a. A uh, processor that's 64-bit because you're going to need more than four gigs of RAM. You're going to need a processor that uh, supports uh, virtualization technology with the Intel chips. You've got the VMT uh, 64 and virtualization. So uh, these are all features of the processor that you need to make sure that your processor supports, and therefore you need to also make sure that uh, that your motherboard supports that type of processor. So if you're looking, uh, for example, um, something in the Intel line, whether it be a uh, core duo, uh, something that has that virtualization, that's what you're going to want. So just make sure you pick a motherboard along the lines that's going to support that. So cool. There you go. I, it's, it's a unique thing, you know, what you choose to go with. So, but uh, tell us more about what, you, uh, what you're looking to do uh, in the forums at category5.tv, and then uh, other viewers can bounce around some ideas and let you know what, uh, what they think you should go with. But the key points are that you need 64 bit. And that means a 64-bit operating system as your host as well, because you are going to be doing virtualization to a degree that uh, you're going to need more than four gigabytes of RAM. So make sure you go with at least eight, 
uh, if you're running as many virtual, uh, virtual machines as you're saying there simultaneously, you're probably going to need more like 12 gigs of RAM. So, Lots of RAM. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Stephen. Hey, Stephen. Can I, can I do the pronunciation here? <laughs> pronunciation, ha, radio operator. It looks like Stephen when I read it, though. It does. But, okay. It does. And Filled it in in the wrong area on the form, <laughs> I guess. It's all good. Stephen's using Ubuntu 10.4. Um, there's a program called Echolink. It is a voice over IP ham radio interface mm. as well. Any help would be great. Thanks. Now, I'm not at all, I, I'm not at all familiar with Echolink. I'm, I've never been into ham radio, but I know that we do have a lot of viewers mm. who are. And that's where a good opportunity comes up. Obviously, the chat room is a great place during the live show because there's a lot of people there. Uh, but also the forums at category5.tv. There's the community forum on the interact uh, menu link. And if you're a registered uh, viewer uh, on our website, you'll be able to interact with other viewers. Great opportunity for you to bounce ideas around or talk about products uh, like that, which unfortunately I'm not familiar with. So hopefully. Uh, Oh, uh, Scorpio55 is in the chat room and knows, seems to know uh, a bit about Echolink. So, um, so also check the chat logs for episode number 174 would be a good idea. Indeed. Mentioning that wine is required. Oh, wine required. Uh, yeah, wine is required for Echolink. So it's a Windows application. Gotcha. Right. Okay. And I should mention as well, uh, MMD Murphy making a good point. Uh, well, oh, mentioning that they have an i7-920 with 9 gigs of RAM. Virtual machines run very well. Um, and Gadwell mentioning that the Core i3 or i5 are good for basic virtualization. Uh, but, of course, the i7s are going to be really good if you're going to be doing a lot of the heavier uh, virtualization as well. And that would, I would think that would be the, the way to go, the i7, if you're going to be doing a lot of virtualization, for sure. Okay. And Ron. Ron, who is... Hey, uh, Ron. I was just saying hi. Oh, I, didn't mean I crazy. thought you said hang on. No, I said hey, Ron. Okay. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. How are you? Sorry so for facing So now that Eric we've there. established that this is Ron asking the question. Hi, um, Ron. Ubuntu 10.04 fresh install is what he's running. Okay. Dear Robbie and gang, that would be us. I cannot seem to play any videos. I just get sound only tried M player, VLC, Miro, all the same. They all used to work, but I have just done a fresh install. Help. Thanks, Robbie, Eric, and Hillary. Okay, um, that could be so many different things, but the first thing that jumps to my mind is uh, restricted extras for Ubuntu, because this is an Ubuntu 10.04 uh, installation. Restricted extras? Yeah. So, if we bring up Synaptic Package Manager, I'm just bringing that up here on my on my laptop. And if we go settings, repositories, and make sure that software restricted by copyright or legal issues multiverse is checked so that you have access to those. And then close that. And if it prompts you, make sure you reload the uh, the list. Okay. It's been a while since I've done this manually, but uh, just type in restricted-extras. You see, I've got these installed, but you can click on that and go mark for installation. And this is going to install a lot of the GStreamer plugins that are going to allow you to do things like DVD playback, so video and things like that. Uh, also, double check on Flash. Make sure that your Flash plugin is, uh, is functioning correctly, which you'll know if you just go to like YouTube or something like that. Uh, that'd be a good test for you. So, uh, let us know if that if that solves it because there there are like I say a lot of different things that it could be or it could be a, co a compound problem as well. But Ubuntu restricted extras is going to install a lot of the uh, codecs that you need. All right. All right. This is Category Five Technology TV, and you'll find us online at www.category5.tv. Hope everybody's uh, having a good week so far. Anything new? Um, hey, did I tell you I got a new Poco plug? Oh, no. carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is kind of neat. What I've got set up tonight 
is the backstage pass. I don't know if you can see that. So viewers who are watching us uh, live through our website can view backstage pass, and this is a service that allows you to see the backstage camera. Cool. Whoa. Huh. <laughs> but here I am uh, with VNC on here. So you were mentioning that it's a little bit choppy because it's a VNC connection okay. to the backstage pass server. But kind of interesting that you're able to do that with the iPod Touch. That's and very cool. Certainly any other device that, uh, that supports, like the Wi-Fi, like an Android device or something would do that as well. So, <laughs> Jot saying, stop leeching the bandwidth. It's all LAN. It's LAN, so it's okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Sorry, Jot. Don't forget, you can get your questions in at category5.tv. Eric's watching the email live at category5.tv and keeping an eye on the chat room. Make sure you say Eric Kid or Robbie F in your, uh, in your message in the chat room, and that's going to alert us to your question. And we welcome your questions. We've okay. got a couple more minutes until Here's the another news. one. Here's one from Chris. The long and the short of it. Hello, dot, Chris. Dot, dot. Mm. I have a fog system set up, www.fogproject.org. This software started on a CentOS box. CentOS, yeah. CentOS box uh, a couple of years ago. And this summer, I moved it into a uh, Ubuntu 10.04 box. Everything seemed OK until yesterday when I wanted to add some computers to the database. I'm getting an error on the input screen saying, failed to create host. So I started poking around the install. Now, before you ask, yes, I followed the guide on how to back up and restore the system, but I'm thinking that since I moved from Cent OS to Ubuntu, I lost right access to the MySQL database. Is there any way to find out who has right access to the system? Is there a way to change it? Am I ever going to figure out databasing? Hmm. That one, I can say not anytime soon. Chris. Hmm. Well, Chris, uh, again, here's one where it could be so many different things, but if, if I'm following you correctly, I, I, I think you're talking about not database permissions, but file permissions on the database itself. So like the files that are involved in the MySQL database perhaps have lost write permissions. Um, what you can do to see the file permissions, uh, just a quick way, like ls is a command that you use in Linux all the time to list the files that you have, right? So if I go to any folder, so go to where your, your files are for the MySQL database and type ls-all and you'll see that that actually tells you who owns and with what permissions each file in each folder. So with your MySQL database, if it's like you say, the, the files themselves have a permissions issue, then perhaps that would reveal that to you. Perhaps when it was copied over uh, during the backup process, uh, maybe it got root or something as opposed to Apache. I'm not sure how the FOG project accesses it, so, but that's one example of, uh, you know, that can commonly happen in a, uh, in a server environment that's running LAMP. Um, so check that and then use chmod to change the, uh, the ownership of the files or the, uh, the folder depending on. And I guess if that's, uh, if that's not what the issue is, if it's not to do with file permissions, then, uh, then let us know. And I hope that that is it. Because it's, it's, that's, a, that's a big question if, it's, if it gets into the actual database itself. But I, I don't think that's what it is because you'd know your username and password for the database. So we're talking file permissions right, here. Right, so it could be. So ls space dash all, and that gives you all the information about all the files and folders that are in that uh, in your current folder. All right. Cool. Um, Pyrosoc wants to know if there's a software RAID program that works in Win 7 and Ubuntu. How do you mean? Like Elaborate, that you, that Pyrosoc. You can, that you can access that software RAID from either system? Like just to just as we're waiting for a response there, yeah. like for example, my my Unraid system, I'm accessing from every computer on my network. Be it Windows, my Windows system that that you're going to see a little bit later, uh, any of my Linux systems, they all have access to that array. For reading a striped array, is this like a NAS RAID that you're thinking? No, in the com. In the computer. 
so you're looking f I, I can't quite follow you like because if it's software based I don't understand really the, like do you mean like you've got your dual booting and you need to have access to the to a software raid from both systems hmm no <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yeah I'm not I'm not quite following maybe put put your thoughts down and and yeah that's what you're looking for uh, okay. so I would I would say pr not that I know of so they, so if I'm following Pyrus Rock here sounds like they've got a raid in the computer they want to be able to dual boot the computer but it's a software raid not a hardware raid right so the so the boot process doesn't see the raid it's not a real raid it's, it's right. software based so I would almost say you'd be better just to get a hardware raid stick a, a raid card in there that's gonna be recognizable at the BIOS level like that's gonna have its own ROM so that by the time it gets to the operating system the operating system just sees it as a drive and you can get those cards for 30 bucks so depending on the raid I mean I'm thinking a raid one but uh, or like a two drive array at least so it's software I don't know of one that will do what I think you're asking it to do sorry good question I think no? I think I'm following yeah one more quick quick question okay uh, if you have a small one because uh, we're just about time for the news or we can just jump right into the news this is category 5 technology TV and you'll find us online www.category5.tv it's nice to have you here tonight and uh, certainly we, we seem to get a lot of questions yeah. these days and and I love that uh, that you're sending in your questions it's live at category5.tv and of course you can also get us in the chat room as well it's a great way to get your uh, your questions into us all right. Category well, five dot TV. You have something. Well, here's there? one that's not a question, so it'll be quick. Sure. Yeah. Hey, Robbie. Congratulations hey. on the new website. It's great. Thank you kindly. Sorry, I was very busy latest, but wish you and your family a great New Year. Best regards, Femi Hassani. Oh, thanks, Femi. from Sweden. Thank you so, so kindly. There you go. Cheers. Nice to have you back. So. I hear Hillary typing away. Is she still making noise? She is. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so you've got some news stories for us, Hill. You all set? I do. I got lots going on. So from the Category 5.TV newsroom, Sony has launched legal action against hackers who uncovered and published a method of revealing security codes for the PlayStation 3. The hack potentially allows anyone to run any software on their machine, including pirated games. Sony's lawsuit argues that this constitutes copyright infringement and computer fraud. One of the hackers involved in cracking Sony's protection code, George Hotz, told BBC News, We have not published any encryption or signing keys. We have not published any Sony code or code derived from Sony's code. Hotz has spoken to legal counsel and feels Sony charges against him have no bias. Inspiration from the tiny holes in a butterfly's wings has led to a process that could soon have huge implications for counterfeiting. Clint Landrock was working on his master's degree in applied science at Simon Fraser University when he came up with the idea of using tiny little holes 1,000 to 10,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair to produce images that could be used to fight counterfeiting. Doug Blakeway, an entrepreneur who works for the university, says, If you tried to photocopy it, you couldn't. It's virtually impossible to reverse engineer. The pair, along with Landrock's professor, have started Nanotech Security Corp. in hopes of inevitably selling the company to a high bidder. Steve Jobs, the CEO of Apple, is taking the, um, a second leave of absence to focus on his wealth. Uh, and this was reported yesterday by uh, e Gap. That's health. Health. A second health. It makes a what difference. did I say? You said wealth. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's not Is focusing on his wealth. Slip, I think. That's a Freudian slip. <laughs> Okay, well, he's taking a leave of absence to focus on his health. Um, and this was reported in engadget.com. While the details are scarce, it is known that Tim Cook will be filing uh, or filling in for Jobs during his medical leave. But Jobs will retain the position of CEO and remain involved in the major strategic decisions. It sounds like it could be an extended leave as Jobs expresses his love for Apple and his desire to return to his duties as soon as he can. 
Race Online 2012 is a venture which aims to push the 9 million people in the UK who have never used the internet to start using online services. And they have the support of UK's digital com uh, champion, Martha Lane Fox. Lane Fox told the Financial Times recently, a good price point is certainly part of what helps people to get online. With this in mind, she's promising the availability of internet-ready computers for £98, hoping that this will tempt the remaining um, 9 million offline users in the UK to get online. There are even plans to offer internet service as a part of the package for as little as £3 per month. The computers, which will be refurbished machines from Remploy, um, will come complete with the telephone support and a monitor, and will be powered by the Linux operating system. Uh, Remploy hopes to sell uh, 8,000 of these machines this year. A new universal gaming platform is coming to Linux as development continues on Lutris. Like other, oh, unlike other systems which let you play Windows games on Linux, the new Lutris gaming platform promises much more. Not only are a good selection of Windows games supported with Wine, but Lutris also includes the ability to run your favorite console system emulators and install games from many platforms, some old, some new. With its sleek cover flow interface, Lutris plans to provide Linux gamers a single platform for running all their favorite games, bridging the gap entirely by offering the ability to run thousands of games on Linux from all your favorite systems. Keep watch on Lutris.net. As reported by the Toronto Sun, scientists from Japan, Russia, and the United States have extracted a tissue sample from a mammoth carcass that has been preserved in a Russian laboratory. They hope to take DNA from the sample and insert into the eggs of African elephant in hopes of producing a mammoth embryo. Researchers in Japan have been working on cloning the mammoth since 1997. A previous attempt in 2008 failed, but scientists have they have since pioneered um, new cloning techniques that allow them to use DNA that has been frozen for years. At this point, the research team believes they should be able to celebrate the birth of a baby mammoth within four to six years. You can get the full stories at Category5.tv slash newsroom. The Category5.tv newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our wonderful community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. For the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Category 5 TV is brought to you in part by Planet Calypso. This massive multiplayer online game is available as a free download from cat5.tv slash calypso. Now once you've got it downloaded and installed on your Windows computer, make sure you say hi. And there's something for everyone here on Planet Calypso, from hunting to mining, crafting, and just plain socializing and having fun with your friends. You can download it for free at cat5.tv slash calypso. If you're a Linux user like myself, of course, this makes it worth the dual boot. Cat5.tv slash Calypso. I'll see you on Planet Calypso. This is Category 5 Technology TV. We're online at www.category5.tv. I'm pretty sure I just said triple W. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Nice to have you here at Turple W. Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the things I want to look at tonight is synergy. No, this is not like a self-help forum or anything like that. I'm not about to start pumping you up. This is about this, yeah. computer software. Fantastic computer software. Imagine a scenario where you've got multiple computers and all of a sudden you can lose the multiple keyboards and mice. So really, really nice when you know you think of a scenario like, like we have here, where we have multiple computers all around us. If I had to have a different keyboard and mouse for each one, oh, that could be pretty tough. Could be. And there are times when being able to control multiple computers from one keyboard and mouse is really, really nice. Like having uh, like a du uh, dual monitor set up, but also with the power of two computer cores, or two computers, right? So if you had two really powerful computers side by side with two monitors moving back and forth just as if they were one computer, but with the power of two. Very cool stuff. So tonight we're going to look at Synergy, and I'm going to take you through the, uh, the actual obtaining of the software, getting it set up, and all that. 
Uh, one of the things that I'm kind of expecting is that you have a, a basic knowledge of networking and in, in that uh, you need to be able to understand how to set up static IP addresses for your computers. Uh, and one of the things that you have to determine is which one of my multiple computers is going to be the server, so the Synergy server. So this is the, the one computer that's actually going to um, host the keyboard and mouse. So this is the one that the keyboard and mouse are actually physically connected to. And then the other computers uh, which are going to be connected through your network are in fact uh, your clients. So they're going to be using the mouse and the keyboard from that server computer. So this is where you need to be able to set up a static IP address because every time you reboot that server computer, you don't want to have to reconfigure each of your computers on the network to be able to connect to it. Uh, fortunately, a lot of times you can get away with using the host name, but in some cases uh, you may need to use the IP address. So, so today I actually uh, I started setting up Synergy here, and there's my laptop and my Windows computer. So I've got my laptop is uh, an Ubuntu-based system, and the desktop is Windows 7. Um, so you see that I have one keyboard and one mouse, but I also have the keyboard and mouse that's built into the laptop itself. What I want to get away from here is having to use the keyboard and mouse, having to lean forward and use the keyboard and mouse for the laptop or this touchpad uh, and be able to just use this one keyboard and mouse. So what I'm going to do is go to synergy-foss.org, free open source software. And you'll see that uh, right there on the home page, they're showing Ubuntu, uh, Windows 7, and Mac OS. So we're going to connect these two computers together, and I'm going to walk you through that so you can see how to do it. So I'm on the Windows system here, and I'm going to choose the download for either uh, 86 or 64. So x86 is your 32-bit, 64-bit, of course. So here I'm using a 64-bit platform, so that's the one I want to choose. And you'll find that, of course, by uh, right-clicking on my computer and going Properties, whether you're 32 or 64-bit. I should mention that this, again, is a free piece of software available for Linux, Windows, or Mac. And uh, you can download it right off of that website. So I'm just going to launch this and go through the really, really quick installation. You'll see how quick this happens. Really, really nice. So I'm going to actually be using now my, my keyboard and mouse are connected to this computer. So I'm going to set this up as the server. So I'm going to launch Synergy Plus for the first time. And you can see, do I want to use another key, uh, computer's keyboard, or do I want to share this computer's keyboard and mouse? That's what I want to do. So I'm going to configure and hop over to my Linux system, go into the terminal, because I'm going to need my host name for that Linux system. And so the way that we do that in terminal is type in the word host name. And you can see it's robbie-laptop-u. So that's what we want to add in here to our Synergy server. So screen name, Robbie-laptop-u, and give it any kind of alias. I'll call this uh, Robbie's laptop. So hit OK. And that's just warning me that uh, I've used an invalid name, so I'm going to remove the apostrophe from Robbie's. So it's just going to say Robbie laptop. And there we go. So that computer's added. Now I need the host name for my Windows machine. So I'm going to go into my command prompt, CMD. Take the same command, it's hostname, and you'll see that this computer is called Broadcast. So we're going to add that the same way. Just type in Broadcast, give it an alias, it's just your friendly name, this computer, and hit OK. So now that uh, both of those computers are added, now here's where we can sometimes get a little bit, it can get kind of confusing because, you know, how do I set up? the actual connection between the different systems. Uh, so what we need to actually tell Synergy is what the positioning of those two computers are. Or if you've got three computers or four computers, you can set those up as well. So back here, I'm going to actually set my positioning. So I'm going to go right of Robbie, uh, my laptop, is broadcast. So essentially, I'm telling Synergy there. Uh, the broadcast system is to the right of my laptop because physically that's uh, where it's located. So I add that. And then similarly to the left of the broadcast computer is my laptop. Now it seems redundant, it sounds redundant, but what we're actually doing there is we're saying, okay, if I move my mouse to the far right edge 
of the laptop monitor, it's going to move over to the Windows desktop. If I move it to the far left, here's where the redundant, where it seems redundant, but I'm actually saying, if I move it to the left, it's going to move over to the laptop. So then you've got that seamless ability to move your mouse back and forth. So I'll add that. And now the commands are set up. Uh, the setup shows that uh, my laptop is to the left of the broadcast system, and broadcast is to the right of my laptop. So I'm going to say OK. And I'm going to start the server. That's all there is to it. And of course, you can also set it to auto start as well. If you look at your taskbar, now you've got the Synergy thing saying that it's waiting for clients. And so it's time to head over to Ubuntu, where we can see in Synaptic Package Manager there, I'm just showing you that we've got, uh, that was Synaptic Package Manager. The version of the software that's in there is an older version, 1.3.1. So what we want to do in this case, because it's an old version of the software, is we want to get the newest version of Synergy, which is 1.3.4 at the time of this broadcast. So that said, we're going to go back to the website rather than using Synaptic. So here I am on the Ubuntu system. Synergy-foss.org. And this time we're going to download the, uh, the Linux version. And this is going to be our client. Just scroll down a ways down the page. And you'll pick the version that, uh, that suits you, Debian and RPM. Uh, so the deb package, of course, being Ubuntu, Debian-based uh, derivatives, um, and uh, that's going to be an installer for that. The RPM files are if you're using a YUM-based distribution, uh, Red Hat or something like that. Um, so it's available for all different platforms. I'm going to download this, the, uh, the Debian file, the deb, and open it with GDB Package Manager. And it looks like I'm going really fast here, but remember this is in real time. This is really how quickly you can get this done. I'm just going to click on Install Package. Enter my password and just let that go. And that's actually setting up Synergy on, uh, on my Ubuntu system now. Gone are the days when installing applications on Linux was a difficult challenge. There we go. Close out of all of that. And now we're ready to actually connect our two computers together. So remember, the server is already running. The server is running on that Windows computer waiting for a connection. You remember that little uh, thing down in the, uh, in the taskbar. And so now we need to make that connection to that computer. So I'm going to go into Terminal again. Just for the demonstration, you can add this as a startup application. First of all, I want to ping broadcast because I need the IP address. You may already know this because you set it up statically. 10.0.0.77 is the IP address that, uh, that broadcast is currently sitting on. So now I want to go Synergy C for client, 10.0.0.77, and hit enter. And instantly, you'll see on your Windows computer, connected. And there we are. So we've got Broadcast and Robbie Laptop U are both connected. And the moment of truth, so drag our mouse over to the laptop, and there we go. I can access the applications menu and everything else over there using the mouse and keyboard, as opposed to having to reach out and use the laptop keyboard. So just speed things along here, type a couple things onto uh, text editors here. So you see on the left, I've got computer one is Robbie laptop, and computer two is the server, the broadcast system. I'm going to copy that to clipboard and paste on the other computer, and you'll see that I was actually able to copy from one computer to the other. So it's more than just sharing wow. just your mouse and keyboard. This is more than the KVM kind of. Yeah, yeah. So you're actually able to copy to some degree simple stuff. For example, good example would be a URL, right? You're on one computer and you grab a URL from that computer and you want to paste it over to the other computer because you've got a certain application uh, to, to use with that URL, for example. So there's a chance for you to do that without having to retype. So I'm going to type copy this onto the Windows computer, copy that. Go back over to the Linux computer through Synergy, just dragging my mouse over there, highlight, and paste. And you'll see that that text was copied directly from Windows all the way over to Linux through nice. my network. Again, Synergy is available for free, synergy-foss.org. And we welcome, welcome your questions in the chat room, category5.tv. Uh, any questions off the get-go uh, with regards to Synergy? Let's see, we did have one, and I lost it already. Oh, 
John? Well, actually, I, I uh, well, good guy wanted to know: Does Synergy work with um, FreeBSD or FreeNAS? FreeNAS has a web interface, yeah, it's doesn't it? Yeah, a web interface, yeah. yeah. And FreeBSD uh, can run uh, Linux applications, so I would think so that you could compile that onto uh, your FreeBSD system, I would think, from source. Uh, check their website and you'll, you'll know. All right. Jot is asking, uh, does it do graphics like DirectX, etc.? In other words, what is the latency like? What we're doing here is we're, sh we're sharing the keyboard and mouse between computers. So any kind of DirectX support, if you're gaming on one of the computers, it's fully reliant on that computer, regardless of whether you've got Synergy or not. Uh, but that said, let's say on my Windows computer, which is a quad core with 8 gigs of RAM, I drag my mouse over and I launch a 3D game, I can then control it with that mouse. No problem. What you may want to do in that case is you might want to hit the scroll lock key on your keyboard so that when you pan far left, your mouse doesn't all of a sudden skip over to the laptop again, because scroll lock is going to lock it onto oh, that okay. screen. Right? So keep that in mind. If you are going to be doing gaming using Synergy, make sure that you, uh, you hit uh, scroll lock on the computer, like have your mouse on the computer with the, uh, with the uh, game, and hit scroll lock, and that'll lock you in. Okay? But the game itself running is fully reliant on the hardware that you're running it on. Hey. Oh, it still needs a monitor. This back to good guy. Yeah. yeah. Still needs a monitor during boots to upgrade the system. I I don't uh, I don't I'm see sure. free NAS as being uh, what what the purpose of of this uh, synergy is for. Synergy is so that with desktop computers side by side, you can move around from one monitor to the next, and you can interact between all of the computers without the footprint of having multiple keyboards and mice. Now, can you still uh, go to your uh, laptop and use that keyboard and Oh, board? absolutely, okay. yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I do, um, because you get used to the fact that you've got your main keyboard and mouse, but then I can still move my mouse over here using the touchpad if I need to. So Awesome. Yeah, it's very, very good. Uh, works best over a hardwired connection, I find, because Wi-Fi is susceptible to... Uh, to drops in speed and things like that. So, of course, if you're gaming and you need that uh, low latency mouse response and things like that, then certainly you're going to want to uh, be hardwired into the network on both ends of the system. So, cool. All right. That's Synergy, and I and I'm glad that we finally got to show how to set that up. Uh, D-Man saying, "Can you use Synergy to connect to a computer in a different room?" I was just going to ask you that very same question. So. You can. Now, now, what would, how would you do that as far as seeing the monitor, though? Oh, we need to because see the other monitor. Because yeah, the, okay, right. the monitor's in the other room, too, right? So okay. if I drag my mouse over there, yeah, I can start clicking on stuff, but I can't physically see the monitor. Okay, so the sole purpose of this would be to drive your wife or your kids nuts when they're on the computer. And you can just... SSH you know, does well at that. <laughs> my wife's on Linux, so I can, I can play around with her system anytime. Okay. <laughs> So I, I can't see a, a purpose in that because I, I wouldn't think that you could. No, so you're you, you can't see the monitor, right? So, but you'll KVM find. Extender. But a, a KVM is a different thing. That's where you've got one monitor. Yeah, but I mean. Here we've got multiple the, monitors. Right. So, think about productivity. Uh, you've got multiple computers. You've got all of your graphic editing software that's already set up on this computer. So you're doing that over here whereas you're over here with chat rooms and surfing. So you can keep your focus on work because you've got all your work stuff over here, but then over here you've got a computer that's dedicated strictly to that and you can move back and forth between the two, much like multi-monitors, but it's not cluttering one computer with certain tasks. The other thing is, much like the cloud, you're able to share resources between multiple computers a lot easier because, for example, if you have network attached storage or an unraid server or something like that you've got centralized storage and then you've got both computers connected to that storage and this is how uh, I'm actually able to do a lot of the stuff that I do on a Tuesday night after the show this computer over here is encoding all the videos this computer over here is doing all the show notes and then I've got another computer that is uh, actually doing all the uploads and things like that so and another one for Planet Calypso <laughs> I don't do that on a Tuesday night because of the bandwidth. I need all the bandwidth I, I can get. Okay. But 
yes, that would be pretty good. <laughs> but see, see what I mean is that you're you're spreading out the the resource usage. So a computer that's encoding video, which is a very very heavy uh, thing to be doing on a on a computer, you don't want to be doing anything else on that computer necessarily mm, because no. it's going to slow it down quite substantially. So then, if you're also trying to do your uploads on that computer, in my case, it can cause failures in the uploads, right? So by spacing it out over multiple computers, I'm able to basically tap into the cores of all those computers, very much like a cloud, but without actually cloud computing. So quite interesting. And there's a lot that you can do with something like Synergy. So, uh, And post your ideas. Get into the forum category5.tv and uh, maybe start a thread about uh, how you think you could use Synergy. And uh, I'll post my ideas as well once I see uh, the, the chats kind of starting up. And I'll give you some real-life examples of how I've used the software. But uh, again, check it out, synergy-foss.org. Uh, certainly if you've got multiple computers side by side, that is a fantastic piece of software to, for you to be using. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and we're online, www.category5.tv. Of course, we would love to have you join us on our website. It's free to register, and that gives you a lot of cool features right there on our website. Speaking of which, how would you love to win a pogo plug? Oh, oh. I already have one. But well, I wasn't talking to you specifically. I'm, okay. You hear what you want to hear. Okay, I've got two of these to give away this week. Whoa. And in order for you to win this, now this is a cloud, we're talking about cloud computing. This is cloud storage, which allows you to store and share your data uh, through the internet so you can access it from anywhere. Cool. Well, I was just looking at the cool picture device. on the back. It didn't make sense to me right away, but now In I'm order for you, <laughs> <laughs> in order to see the back of the box, to see what Eric is uh, on about. You're going to have to win <laughs> one of these. Get onto our website, category5.tv. And I'll tell you what, we're going to take as many ballots as you can send us this week. So it doesn't matter if you send us 10 or 100 or 1,000. If it's 1,000, you're probably going to win one. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we'll take as many ballots as you like. But how, you gotta, how you're going to qualify for this is you're going to register on our website, category5.tv, if you haven't already done so. As a registered, logged-in viewer, visit Hillary's uh, profile. Visit her bio and uh, read up on Hillary. And if you're logged in, there will be some text well, I was getting out in of the, the bio that that's going to actually uh, show you how you can win uh, a pogo plug this week. So register on the website if you haven't already done so. Log in, visit our website, and get into Hillary's bio, and then uh, you'll be able to win a pogo plug this week, hopefully. Cool? Uh, D-Man810 was trying to look at the back of the box hey, and said Eric's head was in the way. So I tried to oh, move okay. out of the way. The backstage you, then, you, then you put it back. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for explaining what that was all about. Y you were wondering, weren't you? I think everyone was wondering. <coughs> yeah. Well, I'm just trying to be helpful. Okay. Just trying thanks. to. Thanks. We appreciate okay. your help. So here's another uh, quick question. Actually, sure. I believe we already have the answer, but uh, I'll, I'll go through it and maybe somebody else will. Uh, okay. Uh, Robbie, I have a problem with my Dell computer with Ubuntu 10.04 and NVIDIA GeForce 8400GS 512 MB DDR2 PCI graphics card. What is happening is when I boot the system, it comes up and says that I cannot detect my graphics settings. I have two monitors plugged into the graphics card. I can boot into safe graphics mode, but cannot get the system to boot correctly. It also tells me that I need to reconfigure my xorg.conf file. Not sure what it is that I need to change. It also sounds like the monitor clicks, like relay inside monitor. It toggles between a black screen and a screen that has multicolored dots at the top. Oh, cool. Um, mm -hmm. I know it is not a lot of info. If you need more, I can try and gather whatever you may need. Any ideas with what I have provided? Thanks, Dennis Kelly. And that's okay. D-Man 810. Um, we just got a message from Dennis, didn't we? Yes, he, uh, he got this worked out. And what did they do? He upgraded to Ubuntu 10.10. .10. All right. And so around. all his problems resolved. Uh, that's great. I'm glad that so. it's fixed for you, and certainly nice to be on the latest version. I'll just mention that when you hear your monitor clicking like that, that's a CRT, is it? Um, it's, it's having trouble getting the resolution that you've got set there. So it's possible that, um, that you've got it set to a resolution that the monitor itself does not support. So that would be what I would check, uh, which you can, you can change on the fly using X, R, and R. 
uh, type that command in Linux and uh, and you'll see what that what that does. Uh, type x r and r space dash dash help. Um, that will allow you to change the resolution of your monitor on the fly uh, in X. If um, and, and that that would be the first thing that I would have checked had you not already uh, upgraded and fixed it that way. And uh, go into NVIDIA settings and change the resolution to auto or something along those lines. So, uh, Jot here is saying that, hey, there's nothing on Hillary's page about how to win a pogo plug. First of all, we strategically planned it so that Jot would not see that, just, just mm -hmm. for the record. But uh, actually, you have to be logged into the website, Jot. Users who are not logged into the website will not see the option to win a pogo plug. You have to be uh, logged in to the actual website in order to see it. And then presto blamo, it will be right there. So, good luck. We're just about <laughs> out of time. Gadwell's planning on sending you a, a thousand uh, entries a day. Fantastic. So, he, he uh, I, was he wondering if he could spam bot you? <laughs> but uh, I guess he could. Well, until um, uh, until our ISP shuts us down, and uh, then we're we're good to go. Uh, we, basically, we're making it kind of easy for the first couple of uh, giveaways. We've got a lot of pogo plugs to give away this year, and uh, I'd like you to uh, have all the uh, chances in the world to win one. Um, so this is this is how we're starting things why off. Why don't we put an R capture on it? Make them listen to that before they enter each time. <laughs> the code is already in the just randomly hit Snow keys out. on the keyboard. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, okay. Hillary, have you had fun tonight? I most certainly have. I was just creeping myself on the new website, checking out my profile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I just was like, I don't see the secret code. I don't see it. Oh. But then I logged in and I saw it. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Hillary will attest that you have to log in. There you go. There you go. Hillary, it's been great having you here this week. Looking forward to next Tuesday night as well. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a blast and so much fun. So thanks, and I'll see you all next always. week. Always. Yeah, have a great week, Hillary. I hope you get lots thanks. of snow in London. Oh, boy. <laughs> lots and lots of snow out here. And I hope you have a great week. Do get your questions in live at Category5.tv. Uh, you'll notice that through the show, I'm really mentioning the, uh, the community forum. Uh, we really encourage you to get in there and uh, and check things out. Um, and uh, certainly there are some people who are helping out with that, especially Gadwill, uh, Andrew Jameson, trying to get things mo moving along. And uh, I just want to, want you to use that as an opportunity for you to get your questions uh, expanded by the community so that uh, if you have stuff that's not necessarily suitable for on air, uh, there's another opportunity for you to tap into this resource of Category5.tv and uh, we'd love to have you participate in that. Again, Category5.tv, and that's the community forum on the Interact menu, and uh, we'd love to see you there. All right. John, yes, great to guys. see you. Yes, guys. Everyone on Backstage Pass is, can see you, and they're waving. But <laughs> so That's all the time that we have for tonight. We've got uh, literally like 10 seconds left. There is one thing that I'm really, really excited about, and John, I know you're going to be really excited about this as well. You're coming out to watch me play hockey tonight? We, uh, no. no. Well, we picked up a, a new device, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a close-up here. As to, uh, that's not a close-up, that's a very <laughs> far away. Let's see, there we go. Oh, that is a very close-up. I don't know if you can read that. It's a Canon HD video lens. Yeah. We're going to be seeing some change over the next little while, my friends. Ooh. Don't miss it. Category5.tv, thanks for being here. See you next Tuesday night. Thanks for letting us into your house. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>